So today's study, we're going to think about the five times that John spoke of himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Our first reading is from John chapter 13 and verse 23. John chapter 13 and verse 23. <clears throat> now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John humbly refers, him, refers to himself as a disciple in his gospel. At the end he reveals that he is the one who has written this book and he humbly refers himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And there are five occasions where we read this phrase and each one furnishes us a very beautiful lesson. What we do learn from this is that when we dwell not on our feeble love for the Lord, which waxes and wanes, but on his love for us, there's a tremendous blessing. There's a tremendous um, encouragement when we do that. And this is the great lesson we learn from John's life, that though he was the son of thunder, and like James as well, sons of thunder, Jesus called them, yet he turned into the apostle of love. And the one who wrote, recorded those wonderful words, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How wonderful is the work that the Lord Jesus did in John's life to turn him into the apostle of love, who spoke so much about the love of God. But how does our love for God increase? Well, John wrote these words in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. And that's where it begins. Our love for him increases when we dwell upon how much he loves us. Our, we don't try and conjure up some kind of love for God, for that will not be possible. It is God who does that work in our heart. When we dwell upon his love, we love him in return. And we do everything that pleases him because we love him. That's how our zeal increases. That's how our discernment increases. That's how um, our comforts increase when we dwell more on his love for us. Let's think before we look at these five verses, the love of believers for the Lord. Love in the scripture is measured a number of ways. First of all, love is measured by time. Love is measured by time. In Revelation 2 and verse 4, Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. The love of the believers at Ephesus was not as it was when they first knew the Lord. As time went by, the moment came when they left that first love. And now it was just a mere affection, just a mere carrying out of duties relating to the testimony. They were very faithful. They were known for their works. They were known for their soundness in doctrine. And they would not tolerate false teachers. Yet despite all of that, the Lord Jesus threatened to remove them as a testimony, as a lampstand, unless they repented because God is not pleased with formality. And let us remember that. Just because we might be sound in doctrine, so we think, just because we do everything properly, doesn't mean God will not remove our assembly from this earth. Because God wants to see fervency, vitality, a real love for him and doing things out of love for him. Nothing else will please the Lord than that. The moment our love changes, and it does change over time. We ask ourselves the love we had for the Lord when we were saved. Do we still have that love for him? When we were first saved, we wanted to do everything for the blessed man of Calvary. Everything we did was out of love for him. It wasn't a formality or a duty, we had a great joy when we are saved and baptized, but as time has gone by, 
as the days and the calendar have gone by, as the weeks and months and years have gone by, how is your love and my love now measured by time? Can the Lord say that thou hast left thy first love? The love you have now is not the same as the love you once had. Love is also measured by temperature. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So Jesus described how love can wax cold. This is true of believers also. There was a time when our love for the Lord was like a burning fire, a vehement flame. Love is indeed described that way in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8 and verse 6. We read there, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. So love is described like a fire, a most vehement flame. Believers can say like the two on the way to Emmaus. In Luke 24, verse 32, they said, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Alas, that burning love, that burning feeling in our hearts can grow cold, can change in temperature. Heart is burning no more and coldness starts coming in. William Cowper wrote, William Cooper, sorry, wrote the hymn, Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. Then he spoke about the time when he wasn't walking with the Lord and he wrote, Where is the blessedness I knew when I first saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Yes, in relation to time, Love can change. Love can be measured by time. Love can be measured by temperature. The love of many can wax cold. Thirdly, love can be measured by quantity. Jesus spoke of the woman which was a sinner in Luke chapter 7, verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So there is much and there is little. There is much love. There is little love. Love can be measured by quantity. Though in the other stories of Mary of Bethany and Mary of Magdala, love is not mentioned, but you can see it in the actions. Mary of Bethany loved the Lord Jesus so much, she anointed him with the costliest of ointment. We read in John 12, 3, then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Mary Magda Magdalene, we read, but Mary stood without the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, John 20, verse 11. There's no doubt she loved the Lord so much, unlike the other disciples who went home, after coming to the tomb, she could not go home, for there's no home left in this world without the Lord Jesus. You know, you can give without loving, as it's often said, because you have to, you give without much love behind it. But you cannot love without giving. Love always gives. And here we see a costly sacrifice made by Mary and that woman which was a sinner, because they loved the Lord very, very much. No amount of money was spared for the Lord by Mary of Bethany. She did her best. Jesus said in Mark 14, 8, she had done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. She gave him a royal burial, a burial worthy of a king that the nation was not going to give him. And so love can be measured by time, by temperature, and by quantity. How is our love? If we dwell upon it, it's not much better than Peter's love. Peter boasted of his love and zeal for the Lord. 
Matthew 26, 33. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Luke 22, verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. But as we know, he failed miserably and ended up denying the Lord with oaths and curses that he ever knew him. You know, when you boast of your own love, you're going to fail miserably. But when you dwell upon the love of God, you become like the Apostle John. Let us think about God's love, the love that we're supposed to dwell upon. Can you measure it by time? Can you put a clock next to it, a calendar next to it? Does it change over time? No, we read these words. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Who can measure an eternal love like that? No clock or calendar could ever be used to measure the love of God. We can dwell upon a love that is vast and eternal. A love that never changed, that never changes. Can we put a thermometer next to it? Can we put a temperature gauge next to the love of God? No measuring instrument can weigh it or measure its length, depth, breadth or height. No human mind can compare, com comprehend the love of God. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 3.19, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, which passeth knowledge. No mind can comprehend an eternal, measureless, vast love that God has for us. And that's the love John dwelt upon, not upon his own love like Peter did and failed. And this is what we need to learn, to learn to dwell not upon ourselves and our weaknesses and failures, and, but upon the Lord's love, what he can do with a person who's a complete failure and nothing before him. Let's think, first of all, of the upper room. Revelation, sorry, John chapter 13, verse 21 to 26. We read the, one of the verses earlier. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be, of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Here we can uh, title this Revelation. Revelation to John. John receives a revelation because he was so close to the Lord and leaning upon his breast. Peter asked him to ask the Lord, who is the betrayer? And John was told. John was leaning in the place of affection on the bosom of the Lord Jesus, upon his heart. John had allowed the Lord to humbly wash his feet, and now cleansed, he is leaning upon that bosom in perfect fellowship with him, dwelling upon his love for him as a disciple. You know, this scene of John leaning upon the breast of the Lord reminds us of the high priest of Israel. He wore an ephod with the 12 stones with the 12 names of the tribes of Israel engraved upon it. Exodus 28, 29, we read about it. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Upon his heart. Those names of the children of Israel upon his heart, it says in Exodus 28, 29. This is a privilege that we all have, like John. We can say, like it says in the Song of Solomon 7, verse 10, I am my beloved's, and his desire 
is towards me. Like John, we can dwell upon the love the Lord Jesus has for us, who is our great high priest, who has us upon his heart, just as John was upon the heart of the Lord Jesus. You know, his heart is moved with love and sympathies and deep feelings and pities towards us. When we lean upon his breast, when we dwell upon his love, those in poverty can look to him, to their great high priest, and find that he is moved in feelings and pity towards them because he knew what it was to have nowhere to lay his head. Those who are suffering anguish of soul, so much anguish mentally, too much to bear, can look to him who suffered such agony of soul in the Garden of Gethsemane that he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Those whose bodies are racked with pain can cry out to him for mercies. For the one who knew what pain is more than any human being has ever known when he suffered on that cross for us. Those who are lonely can look to him, who was forsaken of his disciples and then forsaken of God. Those who are persecuted can look to him, who could say in Psalm 69 verse 4, They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, be mine enemies wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. Hebrews 4 and verse 14 to 15 reminds us of how we can do what John did. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The fourth stanza of the hymn, there is a name I love to hear, as the words, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Let us, like John, learn to lean upon the bosom of the Lord Jesus and dwell upon his love and sympathies and pities towards us. The second occasion is at the cross, and here we can call this title responsibility. John 19 verse 25 to 27. John 19 verse 25 to 27 says, Now they stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. So John was given tremendous responsibility to look after the mother of the Lord himself. Those who dwell upon the love of Jesus can best comfort and care for others. Those who dwell upon the love of Jesus can be fitted for service and responsibility. John was the only apostle at the cross, and therefore the Lord commended the care of his mother to him. Though Mary had other children, we know that Joseph and Mary had children after the birth of the Lord Jesus, his virgin birth. Mary and Joseph naturally had children together. Mark 6 verse 3 tells us, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Now, they did not believe on him, for neither did his brethren believe in him, John 7 5 tells us. But in Acts 1, 14, we find them all together in the upper room praying. These all continued in one, one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And so it clearly uh, is it's seen that they were saved after the resurrection. Before, they didn't believe on him. But after his death and resurrection, his brothers are there. His brethren are there. His family is there with the mother. Now he had two mothers to care for. Salome was his own mother, who followed the Lord from Galilee with her sons James and John. We know his mother was Salome from comparing the accounts in the uh, Gospels. And now he took home the Lord's mother to care for. 
a very broken-hearted woman that day. What Simeon said came to pass. Simeon said in Luke 2 and verse 35, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The pain in our soul must have been very great that Simeon could describe it that way. Like a soul piercing through the innermost being as she saw her own son crucified upon that cross. Yet she knew why he had come into the world. And so we learn how the person who dwells upon the love of Jesus is the one who is fitted for service. But another interesting thing we can add, that this shows the inspiration of Scripture. For John had the Lord's mother with him till the day of her death. He would have known everything about the wise men, the shepherds, King Herod, the flight into Egypt, all the many years, the 30 years the Lord spent in Nazareth. He would have known everything. If the Bible was just written by men, John's Gospel would have been the longest of all and gone into many, many volumes. And he would have written everything about the Lord's life. He would have included the, uh, the story of his birth and all the many things about his life. But he only wrote about the deity of Christ and emphasized that deity and began in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, John chapter 1 verse 1. You see, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write on the theme of the deity of Christ, the Son of God. This shows that the Gospel writers were inspired not just mere men writing down their recollections. Absolute proof of the inspiration of Scripture. The third occasion is at the empty tomb of Jesus, and here I've entitled it, Running the Race. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 4. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. So Peter takes the lead as usual as uh, when we looked at uh, when you think about Peter's life, he's always the first. The first to run, the first to fight, the first to jump into the water, to walk to the Lord. He's the first to speak on behalf of the other apostles. So he's the first to take the lead and run. But he's outrun by John. According to the law of Moses, that to be two or three witnesses to substantiate a fact. So Peter and John were the first two men to see for themselves that Christ is risen indeed. But John outran Peter. The usual reason given is that he was younger. But you see, the scriptures don't just tell us obvious things. There are spiritual reasons why these things are recorded. The reason why John outran Peter is because he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He dwelt upon the love of Jesus and he had more energy and power and zeal than Peter who had boasted of his own love for the Lord and failed. <coughs> this reminds us of what it says in Hebrews 12 about our race. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So like Peter and John ran to the tomb, we need to be running in the race that God has given to us in the Christian life. The race of the Christian life. However, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There we have it, dwelling upon the love of Jesus, dwelling upon him and his love for us at Calvary's cross. That's the motivation, that's what gives us the zeal and the power, like John had, to outrun Peter. 
If we want to do well in the Christian life, we want to run well, we need to dwell upon the love of the Lord Jesus. Not dwell on our failures and faults and say, oh, we can't do anything for God. Uh, and dwell upon ourselves, and that's just self. We need to dwell upon the one whose love can never fail. Fourthly, and fifthly, we have recognition by John in the, the Gospel of John in chapter 21, both the final two occurrences, the fourth and the fifth one occur there. Verse four of John chapter 21, uh, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find it. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Peter didn't recognize the Lord, though he was the first to jump into the water. To go to him, John recognized the Lord. So what we learn from this example is those who dwell upon the love of Jesus are quick in their perception and recognition. They're quick to perceive. They have a spiritual perception. We see this again with the uh, previous occasion when they ran to the tomb, where we read that John and Peter both looked at what was inside, the grave clothes. But two different Greek words are used concerning what Peter saw and what John saw. The word used of Peter just means to behold like a spectator, just to look at. But the word used of John seeing means to perceive with the eyes, to see but understand. So John saw and perceived and understood that the Lord had risen indeed from the dead. John was a discerning man. No wonder in um, his epistles he writes much about discernment. Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 1 John 4 verse 1. See, John was a man of discernment because he was a man who dwelt upon the love of Jesus. The final one is at the end of the chapter, verse 20 to 23. Here we have the return of the Lord in view. After breakfast, after Peter is restored to the Lord, after three times he confesses that he loves the Lord. We read in verse 20, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? What we do learn from here is this. John was following Jesus. That's what it says here. John was following Jesus. The disciple whom Jesus loved, following. He had his eyes upon the Lord. But Peter took his eyes off the Lord and no doubt in love for his fellow brother and his, his fellow uh, brother in the Lord and servant was concerned about him. Peter and John were in the fishing business together. Even afterwards they were together. They healed the lame man in Acts chapter 4. Uh, they went to the temple to pray together. So Peter was concerned about John. What's going to happen to him? If I'm going to die a martyr's death, as the Lord revealed to Peter when he's an old man, he's going to die a martyr's death. What about him? What will happen to him? But the Lord never told anyone to follow him without counting the cost. No easy life awaiting any of them. Death did await Peter, as the Lord told him. 
History tells us it was crucifixion, an agonizing death. Peter said, what shall this man do? But you see, John was already following with his eyes on the Lord and his eyes upon the Lord's returning glory, a time that no one was permitted to know. For the third time in his life, Peter took his eyes off the Lord. First time, Luke chapter 5, he said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Yes, he was a sinful man, broken before the presence of a holy God. Yet he said, Depart from me. He took his eyes off the Lord and upon his own sinful self. Second time, in um, Matthew 14, he took his eyes off the Lord and had put them upon the storm and the wind and the waves and began to sink. And now he takes his eyes off the Lord and puts them upon another servant. And that's not good. The Lord basically said to him, it's none of your business. None of your business. If I tarry till he come, what is that to thee? That is not, not your business. Follow thou me. You must follow me. And so we learn a lesson that we must keep our eyes on the Lord, not be trying to compare ourselves with other servants who might be more successful than us or think we're superior to others, but we should recognize our need to keep our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what John did. His eyes were so upon the Lord and so much upon his love for him. The very last words of John the Apostle are these. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 20. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. May the Lord bless these precious thoughts from God's word to our hearts.